this morning I'm going to continue my message on this enormous topic called grace. We began this journey last week and we are going to continue uh, on for a little time this morning and perhaps next week and in the weeks to come we will, um, you know, have to keep continuing. Now, last week uh, I shared with you that the meaning of grace is that grace is incalculable. Or one characteristic of grace is that it is the incalculable blessing of God and the incalculable favor of God. Amen. If man can calculate grace, then it is not grace at all. Yeah. This word incalculable must be joined together with the word grace. Amen. Amen. There are so many aspects, but I feel that I prepare uh, whatever God has asked me to share with you because this is one of the most, um, it, you know, it's a topic that people have got confused over. You know, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10 it says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to, to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care. Now here, uh, uh, in 1 Peter 1.10, the Bible is saying that the prophet spoke about the grace that was to come. Amen. Hallelujah. Not that there was no grace in the Old Testament. Of course, Amen. there was so much of grace. Amen. But the, the prophets are saying, or the Bible is saying that these prophets of old were searching intently for a new level of grace that was to come. Amen. In John chapter 1 verse 16 it says, Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. Now God is a God of grace. But in this scripture it says that now we are under a new grace. Grace in place of grace. Amen. And if the prophets have been searching intently then so should we. We should be searching intently. I want you to understand a few things about grace. Grace is not a reward for good works. Mm. Amen. You can't earn grace. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's never a reward. Amen. Grace is the goodness of God. Grace is for the undeserving. You know, when it comes to salvation, salvation came to us as a gift given by grace. Did we deserve salvation? No, we didn't. Grace continues right throughout our life. Grace is God's inconceivable generosity. And if you can comprehend grace, then it is no longer grace. I shared with you last week, John Newton said, Grace is amazing. When grace comes, you will stand amazed. Amen. I'm going somewhere with this, so just keep listening. Man's way of getting blessed by God is through achievement. Man's way is by achievement. God's way is by receiving. Grace is not something we can achieve. Grace is when we humble ourselves and say, God, I receive your grace. Grace comes in one way. It comes by your knowledge of the glory of God. Now, people in those days were confused about this new grace. People stoned the disciples. They wanted to kill the disciples. Why? Because they preached something that was so easy. That was the reason they were wanting to kill these people. Because the message that the, that, uh, uh, the synagogues and uh, the Sanhedrin was, had been preaching for generations was about a God who was ferocious. A God who punished people. Now the disciples come and they are preaching about grace. 
And this grace was, it went so much against their way of thinking that they said, surely we've got to kill these people. We've got to imprison these people because their message is going against our message. Now in Romans 2 4, this is an amazing scripture. This, now this is a question. Despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? He's asking a question. Do you despise the riches of God's goodness? Do you despise the long suffering of God? Not knowing that the goodness of God. Lead, leadeth thee to repentance. Now, this is what happens. Grace is not a reward. But grace is something that comes upon all people. And God's intention for releasing grace in people is that, there, is that His grace leads them to repentance. I'll give you a a practical example which I experienced this week. There was a person who I was trying to get to church. He's in business and uh, he told me, he said, uh, you cannot convert me. I said, I'm not trying to. I'm only telling you about Christ. This has gone on for a few months and uh, yesterday he just happened to come home and he said to me, he said, uh, I've decided to uh, become religious. I have decided to take a few steps closer to God. I said, what happened? He said, I'm having the most amazing breakthroughs in my business. And he said, this is definitely God. Man. Thought, wow. <laughs> we think that man comes to God through punishment. No, here it says, the goodness of God leads man to repentance. Yes. So we have to view this grace differently. And the more grace that God releases upon us, the closer we get to God. Amen. It's not the other way around. It's not that we have to get close to God for God to release His grace. No. Then it becomes something we earn. It becomes a reward. I like this scripture, Genesis 19, 22. This is nothing but the grace of God. God says to Lot, flee that quickly because I cannot do on anything until you reach it. Now, God came to Lot and said, Lot, I want you to disappear. I want you to leave Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. And then he says, uh, now I am impatient. I want to bring destruction upon this simple place. But I cannot do it until you are here. Now Lot, I tell you, I will one day preach to you about Lot. Lot was not a good person. Uh, uh, Amen. Uh, he was a fleshly man, a sinful man, given to temptation. But the grace of God on Lot was, Lot, Go from here. Because as long as you are here, I can do nothing. Amen. Now let's look at the opposite. Just because you are in your family, destruction will never come. Just because you are in that business, destruction cannot come. Just because you are in your neighborhood, your neighborhood is safe. Hallelujah. And this is what God said to Lot in the Old Testament where the new grace had not come. But they were operating under the Old Testament grace. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 18 says that he, uh, Paul is praying that you may be able to comprehend together with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ. You cannot understand the love of God. You know, when my kids, children are much younger, especially my son, 
he went through a season where he would come and say that how much you love me <laughs> and i didn't or everything that i said to him didn't really make sense and then he said if i fail my exams you will love me if i do this you will still love me because as a child he could not grasp and understand the depth of a parent's love in the same way you and i right we can never understand the depth and height and width and length of god's love because man has a tendency of judging god by human standards i mean a famous thing that we would say, people would say is to to see good people you know repent before god gets angry we have brought god down to a human level you think god is going to get angry with people the bible says he is slow to anger one preacher said god's slowness to anger is like putting a uh, uh, taking a saucepan full of milk and lighting a match and waiting for it to boil that is how long god takes to get angry now when man sins it's not anger with which he responds it's with love that he responds hallelujah and a feeling a, a compulsion to go after that sinful person one day jesus demonstrated that in jerusalem he looked over israel he looked over jerusalem he saw the the sinful state of that country of that nation as they rejected the messiah and the bible says he looked upon them and wept even though he had all the power all power had been given unto him all power in heaven and on earth he could have called on fire he could have called on destruction but he stood over jerusalem and the bible says he wept that is the god of grace he is not angry over you but there are times he will be for you Are you hearing what I'm saying? Give it up, man. Now, man's journey in in Christ is demonstrated through the journey of the Hebrew people from Egypt to the land of Canaan, and we see that. the hebrew people were in terrible bondage under the yoke of slavery in the nation of egypt and that situation depicts us as human beings under the slavery of the kingdom of darkness before we came to know christ and so god came to the hebrew people and delivered them out of the bondage of this of slavery which equals Uh, our salvation they then leave uh, that place and their next their next destination is uh, the sea the red sea and the red sea signifies the, the holy spirit coming into our our lives everybody who's born again has the holy spirit inside and so they go through the red sea and christians have the experience of receiving the holy spirit and then they go into the desert you know many 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 christians unfortunately live in this desert even today let me tell you a few characteristics of of the desert the desert is a place of miracles every day there was a miracle in the morning miracle in the evening food in the morning supernatural water a pillar of fire and light a cloud over the day a land of miracles their clothes never wore out but you see this was never god's 
final destination for the Hebrew people, nor is it God's final destination for us. We are not supposed to live from miracle to miracle. Many years ago, that's what I believe. I believe that I should live from miracle to miracle, but I tell you, it is stressful. Isn't that right? And for 40 years, they could not enter his final destination, the land of Canaan, because of unbelief. Mm. Because they did not, could not believe that there was a better place than the place of miracles. They couldn't believe that the goodness of God would stretch to another level of grace in the land of Canaan. And so the Bible says, they came to this place to the end of, at the end of the 40 years, they came to the end of the desert. And you, you know the story. They, they stepped into the land of Canaan. And the first thing that happened in the land of Canaan is that the miracles stopped. No more miracles. But you see, now you have to understand, it was a desert with no water, nothing. But Canaan was an oasis, a lush oasis. And the vegetables and the fruit that grew in Canaan uh, was unlike anything that we, we see even today. They came into this land, the miracles stopped, but they stepped into the miraculous. And they lived in the miraculous, enjoying the miraculous every day as if it was never a miracle. God wants you, to, you and I to live in a place flowing with milk and honey. And every day when the goodness of God comes, it will draw us closer and closer to God. Amen. A place of amazing freedom. I want to end with just, just this one thing. I am just so compelled to tell you. Grace is a place where there are no laws. Mm. Now, you have to be very careful because people have taken this and perverted it and made it a license to sin. So I'll put it like this. Now, in this earthly realm, we have traffic police. And there are laws. And then there, are, there is punishment if you break the law. So, we, do we need laws in this in this fallen world? Yes, we do. When we go to heaven, do we need laws? No, because the laws are written in our heart. Nobody ever sins. Nobody ever does anything wrong. In this place called grace, we don't need laws. The laws are inside us. Hallelujah. Amen. We don't need to be told, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other thing. Because the, those things are they're in our DNA. Hallelujah. Now next week I will talk to you about righteousness, but I want you to understand grace comes in twins. Grace does not come alone. Grace comes with righteousness. I'll give you that scripture. Romans 5 17, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will, will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life. Grace comes with a twin. The name of the twin is righteousness. Where there is no righteousness, grace does not offer. Hallelujah. Now, people think that God has done away with the laws. Yes, He's done away with the laws, but He's placed it inside our hearts. And where there is a breakdown of righteousness, grace is stopped from operating. Please understand that. And the more and more you walk in the righteousness of God, more and more grace you will experience because it's a twin gift righteousness and grace you want grace 
walk in holiness. Amen. Amen. And you Amen. come to a place where you don't see laws. Yes. You don't need laws when you're righteous. In heaven, there are no ten commandments. In fact, I have come to understand that, you know, sometimes we only think that in the Old Testament there were ten commandments, but there are 663 laws. <laughs> Amen. And you know that the laws of the of the New Testament are much more, are much more strict than the Old Testament. Hallelujah. I mean, in the Old Testament, one of the ten commandments is, "Thou shalt not kill." In the New Testament, he says, "If you call your brother a fool, you have committed murder." Isn't that right? The Old Testament says. Thou shalt not steal. In the New Testament it says, if you covet somebody else's property, you have already sinned. It's much higher. Much, much higher. And it's so high that man without the gift of righteousness cannot achieve it. Yeah. And this scripture which we will go through at, a, at another uh, uh, point, at a, at, on another day, will show you that righteousness is also uh, not something one can achieve. It's something one has to receive as a gift of God. How can the Bible says? How can a young man keep him keep his ways clean? Only one way: if he hides God's word in his heart. Only God can set us free from sin. And righteousness is a free gift of God. And when you when you receive this righteousness, you come into a freedom. And in that place of freedom, you enter into the miraculous. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Grace is not for the deserving. Grace is for the undeserving. Amen. The purpose of grace is to draw us closer and closer to God. And those of you who think, you know, I have got to be a good person. You know, to impress God. I tried that and failed miserably. We have all tried it. We can do nothing until the Holy Ghost comes and makes us righteous, draws us close to God. But only we, we can only cry out to God and tell Him our intentions. God, I want to be righteous. God, I want to be sinless. God, I want to be perfect. And the hand of God will be outstretched towards you from the heavenly realm and he will draw you and you will be sinless you will be righteous and then you will enjoy that voice is called heaven the land of grace in the name of jesus hallelujah shall we rise to our feet and pray Father, we want to thank you yes. that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross. Amen. That we can come into and enjoy the land called grace. The unmerited favor of God that we will experience the incalculable blessing of God. Oh, we will not despise the blessing, the abundance of your blessing, nor the forbearance not the long suffering of God towards us. But we will stand in a place and receive your goodness. Lord, may your hand be extended towards us as you draw us close to yourself in righteousness. And the glory of God will come upon us. Lord, let your grace reign over our life. In Jesus' name, righteousness and, and grace come upon every person who can hear the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name, grace and peace come. Grace and righteousness come. Grace and blessing come. In Jesus' precious.